Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Dustin Bird, Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the University of Olivet. <laughs> also the founder and editor-in-chief at Ekparosis Press and the founder and the co-director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. And today we're going to be talking about the just war theory with Dr. Rudolf Siebert. As a species, Homo sapiens have gone to war with other Homo sapiens even before they were Homo sapiens. War and other forms of systematic violence appear to us as being an integral form or integral part of the human condition. No matter how, what historical epoch we look at, we find war. And in some ages, periods of peace seem to be the exception. War is brutal, barbaric, and bloody. It not only destroys infrastructure, architecture, towns, and villages, but also destroys our minds, our souls, and in many cases, our futures. Yet, war captivates us. We watch movies about war. We play game, uh, games of war. We study the masters of war whom we admire. We are entertained by the circus of slaughter that war brings us. Existentially, war delivers meaning to us. We look fondly on the wars we've won and we try to bury the wars we've lost. Our feelings of alienation, loneliness, and isolation are temporarily overcome when we go to war as we feel an uncontrollable urge to dissolve our individuality into the collective fervor of war and support those who have brought it to our doorstep. On the other hand, we understand that sometimes war can be a necessary evil especially when mad the madness of men induced by genocidal imperial, imperial ideologies compel them to invade their neighbors, assassinate leaders, oppress their people, and massacre the unlawful. <laughs> War, it seems, can be a form of defense of humanity as it is a paradoxical loss of humans to save humans. At its core, war embodies a dialectic of barbarity, a mass slaughter of innocent and the guilty in the name of saving the innocent from the guilty. In the Jewish and Christian traditions, the messianic vision compels us to contemplate the image of sword, swords being beaten into plowshares, Isaiah 2, 3 through 4, an image of humanity growing up and sacrificing its war machines on the altar of peace, community, intersubjectivity, and unconditional love. In Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth says, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. But we must admit at the same time, many are ready to die by the sword if the sword means to protect, while others are prepared to die by the sword if the sword brings glory, new lands, a restored empire, and so on. In the Islamic tradition, war is a regrettable means to end conflicts that have no other means to be resolved. Yet the Prophet Muhammad, despite war, despised war. He was not eager for war, but when he was engaged in war, he upheld the dignity of humanity as much as he could amongst the mass slaughter, the grotesque mass slaughter. The justness of war, both in its causes and its prosecution, has long been subject of debate within the Abrahamic traditions. Nevertheless, the doctrines of what a just war is has frequently been violated by devotees of those religions, just as secular powers have violated the secular laws, including the Geneva Conventions, in prosecuting their own wars. It seems that the religious and the secular have one thing in common. They both belong to humanity, and humanity has always found ways to make war. Our topic of discussion today is the just war theory, what it is, how it has been used and abused, and its future. We are joined by Dr. Rudolf J. Siebert, who was a combat veteran, having fought both in the Luftwaffe and the Wehrmacht during World War II. Dr. Siebert's war experiences have shaped his perspectives on humanity, religion, politics, and the potential for peace in a future society. He will offer us insights into both the theory and the lived experience of war. Dr. Siebert is a professor emeritus of religion and society at Western Michigan University, Department of Comparative Religion. He taught at WMU for more than 50 years. He's written hundreds of articles, dozens of books, and has educated tens of thousands of individuals in the United States, Canada, Europe, Israel, and even Japan. He's a member of the Institute for Critical Social Theory and is currently working on a book regarding the fascist temptation and the democratic response to that temptation. If you're interested in further studying doc the works of Dr. Siebert, please see the links in the description below. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. You're welcome. So this is a long and 
sordid topic, one we've talked about many times over 20 plus years. Um, and so I figured that it would probably be best to contextualize it a little bit with your own experiences. And can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in combat uh, in World War, World War II? Yeah. Well, I was 11 years old when the war started in 1939, and I was 15 years old when I was drafted. Together with my whole class of the uh, Lessing Gymnasium, that was a humanistic high school, we learned Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and uh, so we all together were drafted into the, some of us in the Air Force, and so I was in a Badrinian airport in Frankfurt, and we had to protect Frankfurt and um, then also the airport with many uh, of the airplanes which were there to defend the cities as well. And it was cl close to the city of Höchst, where the IG farm industry was centered, and we were supposed to protect them as well with four heavy guns, eight, eight guns, and um, we were very successful until something happened when I was just a few weeks in the Air Force. The British had caught some kind of a radar instrument, which the Germans had invented, and they stole it from the coast and uh, studied it. And they found out that this radar was reacted to silver paper, like to the body of airplanes. And so they tried that the first time in Hamburg, and one side the silver paper came down and the radar reacted as if the planes were coming, but the planes were really coming from the opposite side and bombed the whole city to pieces. It was a horrible technological shock for the whole Air Force and for the whole army. And the officer who was in charge of my battery, he was ordered to find out how one could differentiate radar in such a way that it could differentiate between silver paper and the bodies of the airplanes. It was a problem for the rest of the war. So these were my first activities in the war. And uh, later on then, I was transferred from the Air Force to the Army, and I was in an officer's school uh, to train anti-tank uh, personnel. And so we were supposed to go to the Soviet Union and fight, fight atheistic communism there. And, um, but it didn't get that far because General Patton crossed the Rhine River. And so I then was sent against Patton instead of uh, to Russia. So um, how did your experience uh, in World War II in combat uh, affect how you think about philosophically, morally, ethically uh, about war and peace? Well, I grew up in the Catholic youth movement and the Catholic youth movement was very critical of the Hitler youth. I had to be in the Hitler youth at the same time. And so we had all kinds of military training in the Hitler youth and the Catholic youth movement was against it. So therefore also there was no anti-Semitism in the Catholic youth movement neither. And um, the Catholic movement was not in agreement with the uh, war goals, but there was no way to become a conscientious objector for, for instance. So there were two farmers in Germany who rejected to be drafted. They were both sentenced to death and they were executed and the priests who went with them to the execution told them that the state was right, that they had the obligation to serve in the army because the Catholic Church had no conscientious objector. That came, that uh, law came only about after the Vatican Council. So uh, that was the twisted situation now. Uh, there was no way legally to uh, not to be drafted or not to go uh, to the Air Force or the army in spite of the fact that uh, we, I was not in agreement with the war goals as such. So it was a very twisted type of a situation. But the overall culture was that in that very peaceful, humanistic high school that we learned then already very early um, sentences like everything flows, 
by Heraclitus, everything flows, and then also Pantare, and the other thing was that the uh, uh, Polymos, Patea Pantone, the war is the father of all things. So that was in the overall culture, even in the humanistic part of this culture, or the Christian part of this culture. So um, when we were drafted, we did not think that we could uh, you know, avoid this somehow because the whole culture around us, even the good parts of it, were somehow for this, the war is the father of all things of Heraclitus. Sure, I mean, when you study the classics in, in a humanistic uh, setting, uh, for certain, the, the the Hebrew Bible is full of war. The Greek history is full of war. Roman history is full of war. Um, you know, and even there's the, the the apocalyptic images and visions of of this coming wars in in the Christian New Testament. So um, it's hard to get around, uh, hard to get away from this this war as it saturates the civilization in many ways. So on one side there is this whole culture, but then when it really uh, comes to action, the empiricism of war is something completely different. So I was part uh, later on of the Battle of Aschaffenburg. That was part of a second defense line in Germany. The Siegfried line had been broken through by Patton, and then the soldiers had been told, now the war is won, there is no resistance anymore. And suddenly they came to this Aschaffenburg, where I was sent with my battalion as well, and they found out that there was a fierce resistance against them, and it was a real moral problem uh, for the for the American army. And the casualties in the Battle of Aschaffenburg, the American casualties were double the German casualties. So it was a furious thing. And I, I remember how strange this was that two armies with thousands of men were moving toward each other with their technology and were killing each other. So in the last battle on the Hanan camp, I lost my whole company, 250 men whom I then visited for 50 years on the cemetery there. But I remember the eeriness, the uh, strangeness. Everything is mecha mechanized. Everything is depersonalized. I, I did a Renaissance commando. I approached early in the morning the American tanks in order to count how many tanks there were. And the soldiers were in the tents. They were still sleeping, some were awake. It was the first time that I heard American English in the tents, and they had no idea that I was close by and was counting them. And uh, so, but it is the objectivity all human subjectivity seems to be extinguished in this process, and it is hard to describe. In, all, in spite of all the books we have about war experiences, also critical ones, it is still very hard to grasp what is really happening when people who do not even know each other and may not even really hate each other, neither, but uh, are nevertheless going through their functions of killing each other. It always reminds me of the the Christmas, you know, the little Christmas armistice in World War One between soldiers when they came out and, and sang Silent Night together, uh, you know, and, and exchanged cigarettes and maybe some some beer or something. But then, of course, they immediately in the next day had to go back to killing each other with this mass right. slaughter. The, the irrationality of the whole thing just seems very apparent in that moment. It was a moment of humanity in the middle of utter barbarity very true so let's move on to just war theory um because that's the subject of of our talk today try to figure out what it is um it's past it's it's present in the present moment as we have two major wars going on and also with the possibility of its future um now, while there are many different forms of, of just war theory the one we'll be talking predominantly about today is the one that was devised by Saint Augustine uh, in the in the in the Western tradition, obviously the the Muslim world has a very strong uh, tradition of a just war theory, which really begins during the the uh, Sira or the the biography, the history of the Prophet. But we're going to discuss uh, today 
uh, Augustinian just war theory and the seven points. So, so why did the historically, let's say, why did the concept of a just war have to be created by St. Augustine? Well, St. Augustine came about 100 years after the church made peace with the Roman state or the Roman state made peace with, with Christianity. Uh, none lives at Esavos, you are not allowed to exist. That was the law in Rome against the Jews and against the Christians. And so the, um, no soldier could enter the Christian community in the first 300 years until Diocletian stopped the persecutions and then Constantine paved the way to the an alliance between church and state. And that changed everything. That means the Constantinian Christianity came about, which is still with us today. We thought with the Second World War, it came to its end, but it hasn't really. So, and so then some kind of a compromise had to be made. The church did not know of any just war. All wars were unjust. And now came Augustine and thought that sometimes these Germanic tribesmen came into Rome and slaughtered these uh, young women and they unraped them and one had to defend them. And so he developed then the seven point just war theory and uh, we have them here, you have, have them down there. And um, then later on others were uh, added to it. So, but it was definitely a compromise from that what Jesus had taught. But what has Jesus taught? And there is when Hegel says that the Christ is a contradiction or Sitchek today says the same thing, even a monstrosity. Uh, the contradiction is really painful because it is true that uh, Jesus had the fourth commandment of the Sermon on the Mount to hold up the other cheek. But there is also a statement like, I have not come to bring peace. I have come to bring war between father and son, mother and daughter, mother and whatever, in the whole family. So that means that Jesus was very much aware that his own teaching brought conflict, that he continually was involved in conflict with the business people, with the priests, with the Pharisees, and so on. So one cannot describe Christianity simply as a harmless operation. It was not like Spartacus, of course, <clears throat> who led the slaves against Rome and then was crucified maybe with 10,000 uh, slaves on the Via Appia and so on. But it was another type of conflict when Jesus taught the equality of master and servant, men and women and so on. When Paul sends the slave back but tells the master that he should remember that he was his brother now and that uh, he told the same thing to the slaves. So that undermined definitely the slave system, which was the very basis of the Roman Empire. And when some people of the Enlightenment say that Christianity really destroyed Rome, then it was certainly only one factor, but there was some truth to this. When you dissolve the master-servant relationship, um, then you hit at the very foundation and uh, so Christianity became dangerous. So when the Romans said, let's say as a voice, you are not allowed to exist, they had of course some reason for that as well, because they may very well have um, felt that there was threat to their whole system in all of this. So. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, the attitude now changed, and uh, uh, so therefore the Augustine had some of them. So uh, that uh, that there must be a competent authority. So that would be the king. With us today, it would be the um, the Congress, or it would be the Parliament, and so on. We have to declare war, and then the probability of success. You must be sure, uh, must be certain to some extent that you can really win. A non-winnable war should never be started. And then the um, the uh, uh, war as a last resort. So you have to try everything else in order to, um, to uh, not to enter a war. By the way, this law <clears throat> or the, this uh, theory was valid or is still valid, but the, uh, the Bush uh, administration used that war 
in order to justify the Iraq wars as, as, a, as just wars. So it is still of actuality. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> when you look, look really who obeyed it, there were only two cases in 1,500 years where a king or a queen would say, I cannot do this war because it contradicts some of the seven points. One was Maria Theresa, the empress of uh, Austria, who wanted to make a war against the Prussians and said this cannot be done because it wouldn't be a just war. The other one I've even forgotten. So, um, but it was it's a precarious thing in terms of theory and praxis. The theory was there, but it was practiced only twice in 1500 years. So one has to, if we discuss this, we must have in mind how precarious this whole thing is. So then it must be a just cause. What is a just cause? Is a just cause to free people from colonization? Is that a just cause for somebody to start it or to somebody to defend, to defend this? So um, just cause, <laughs> and then uh, very precarious thing, combatants and uh, non-combatants. I mean, already my experience when I defended those different cities in the Rhine Main area, I mean, there was saturation bombing there, and that was civilians, of course, men and women and children and so on. It, uh, that could have been avoided. So General Harris invented that saturation bombing which would include civilians. One could have concentrated just on military objects, but that wasn't done. So um, the and, and General Harris was never put on any trial, on any Nuremberg trial or what trial uh, for that, what he did, because um, it was revenge. It was a counteraction to what the Germans had done in bombing London and uh, hitting civilians as well. So. But uh, now when we look forward in terms of uh, atomic wars or hydrogen wars and so on, it is uh, just uh, um, impossible to keep uh, the, the uh, uh, civilians out of the battle. So the Hiroshima and Nagasaki were full of civilians. They were only civilians. So um, that uh, is obviously becomes more and more difficult. And uh, as the weapons proceed, uh, weapon production and improvements and whatever, the more impossible it becomes to uh, keep uh, the civilians protected in any kind of a conflict. Then proportionality was one element and the military necessity. Um, and so these were the seven, but then there were a few more came um, later on. So the treatment of prisoners of war I was a prisoner of war of the uh, American army, and uh, I was brought from the battlefields in the uh, um, battle of um, the second defense line in, in Germany, and I was brought to Virginia and was then a prisoner in Camp Allen for a year. And on the whole way, I was treated exactly according to the Geneva Convention. So I had no complaints. The only complaint was that when I was sent back in order to participate in the denazification of Germany. Somebody made a mistake in the Pentagon and sent the Nazis home to Germany and the anti-Nazis who had been trained to um, Le Havre and then Bolbeck. And there was a camp for the SS, an American concentration camp for the SS. And that was definitely against, um, against the Geneva Convention. They were used in um, in mines to mine coal, but they were also used in the minefields where the uh, uh, maps had been lost in the Normandy, and there you uh, always were in danger to lose a leg or an arm or whatever. And when I then finally came home, I went to the military government in Frankfurt, the IG Farben building, and uh, complained about this. And later on, books were written about these uh, violations. As far as the German army is concerned, and uh, I was confronted with uh, Russian prisoners and um, and French prisoners and uh, English prisoners and uh, American prisoners, and I always asked, I know when I was a young guy, how they were treated in the battery where I was employed, there were, were Russians, and I, every we shared our bread with them, and I asked them all the time if 
if they had been treated badly. So one night I saw them carrying the heavy grenades there in the battle. And I asked them next day if they had been uh, beaten up or what by their very strong Lithuanian uh, German soldier who, uh, who kept, kept them there, who watched them. So, But they said they had not been forced. They were just fighting the next war. That means the next war between capitalism and socialism. And they were all Marxists and all spoke very well German. And I think they would have told us if, if they had been mis mistreated or maltreated. So, <clears throat> so nevertheless, I, my own experience um, on both sides <clears throat> as a prisoner myself and looking at prisoners in German camps, I, I didn't see, but they happened. I'm quite sure that um, Germans did violate, and I know some incidents that, that it was violated. And there was a temptation, of course, to violate that. So when Trayston was bombed four times in the same night by thousands of airplanes and completely devastated, um, Hitler was so uh, en enraged by it that he gave the order that all the American and British pilots who had been caught in the prison camps were full of, of prisoners, that they all should be executed. And uh, the German military leadership refused to follow that command because the other side would do the same thing. So uh, that also other things, they are sometimes good laws are kept even during wartime. So after the First World War, the gas war um, had started in the war. Had, the gas war had started. Fritz Haber had invented the gas, and um, but there was uh, laws about that in the Geneva Convention, and nobody used gas except in the camps there. The Germans did, but in the real warfare, <clears throat> no gas was used. <clears throat> in spite of the fact that Churchill was tempted, when Werner von Braun sent his rockets to London, uh, Churchill almost ordered that the uh, the population in Germany should be gassed. That means the bombs should contain gas. And the Admiralty had a hard time to convince the old men that this would bring revenge and that the Germans would put gas into the rockets and would gas the whole southern part of England. So um, the temptation was there, but the hopeful thing is that one can make treaties which can even be held on both sides. And, and if it was only the fear that the other one could revenge, could uh, do the same thing to oneself. So there was um, once uh, one of the poets, Steinbeck. Steinbeck was a socialist first, then he became a nationalist, and then he uh, told the American government they should put false money over Germany and ruin its economy. But his plan was rejected because the British were afraid the Germans would put wrong money, false money on their territory as well and ruin their economy. And so, so uh, there, there are interactions between combatants which are astonishing. Astonishing is in how much contact they are, even when they are killing each other at the same time. So, uh, <coughs> um, so this, as far as the um, treatment of prisoners were concerned. Um, and then, then, of course, that no crimes are, um, are really committed in, in the real criminal sense, like um, the um, population of starvation of a population, or <clears throat> when the Eastern Army came to Berlin, the, the raping of women was, was uh, horrifying. When the Northern Army or Chukov came, that was a completely different way. They helped the German women and give them water and whatever. But one army of the same same country can behave in a barbarous way and in a more uh, uh, cultured way. So <clears throat> that um, was another thing which was... Uh, uh, and then what was also new then after the Second World War, was the justice of um, uh, justice after the war. There was this horrible experience <clears throat> that the Germans thought they had won the First World War, and suddenly the uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff uh, uh, asked the emperor to ask for an armistice. 
<clears throat> and the war was lost after all these um, sacrifices which people had made. <clears throat> and then Lord George even criticized this, the so-called dictator of Versailles. And of course, that was the core of Hitler's speeches. Uh, the German had to pay in an unbelievable uh, reparations and were occupied par partially and so on. And it was this uh, Versailles dictate which to a large extent produced the Nazi movie, the nationalistic movement, and gave Hitler wind into his sails. He had been a soldier himself. He had suffered through five years, four years, and uh, so he had the whole army behind him when he started his agitation and then identified the Jews as the real culprits the, uh, uh, who had made profit from the previous war. And so there was this speech which he gave. And if the high, Jewish high finance, like the Rothschild, once more make uh, instigate a war among the Aryan brothers, that will be the not the end of Europe, it will be the end of the Jew, Jewish race. And he gave that speech three times. And uh, after that, Pearl Harbor happened. That's when the World War became a real world war. And uh, then the, uh, the uh, annihilation of the Jewish people in the Eastern camps really was became full blown and uh, came in this unbelievably uh, horrible um, Holocaust situation. So that's just this after the war, and then uh, the Allies learned something. Uh, so in the Second World War, um, they were afraid that the, uh, all of Europe would become communistic. And so the Marshall Plan was instigated, and uh, they, that made all the difference. So uh, the Marshall Plan was even offered to the Soviet Union and uh, to the Eastern countries, but they rejected it because they thought they would become dependent on capitalism and they didn't want it. So, but uh, there was suddenly the denazification stopped. There were no no back trials anymore, and um, the Allies tried to get, uh, particularly America, tried to get the German population on their side, and that means then that old Nazis all returned. Um, so my uncle was denazified in the eastern part of Germany and fled then to the western part. The Western part, he got his pension back again in the Eastern part. He lost his pension. He had to work in Kali mines. And uh, so the Eastern part of Germany did a horrible job of, uh, a very thorough job of denazification. But in the, in the Western part, it stopped. And uh, that had all kinds of consequences, of course, up to the, even the present situation. <clears throat> so, that uh, as far as the, um, uh, the, the so the, in all together we maybe have maybe ten um, uh, more uh, ten parts of the just war theory as it is evolved now, and I think the greatest difference makes the progress in weapon technology, the atomic weapons, the hydrogen weapons, because most of these points cannot be realized anymore in the new situation. Even already when uh, Dresden was bombed, Dresden, all four attacks were as much as one atomic attack. And uh, the questions, of course, why that has been necessary. And Dresden was not done for the Germans. Dresden was done in order to give a message to the Soviet Union that they had to uh, keep the Yalta agreements. And as far as the atomic bomb was concerned in Japan, it was not the Japanese anymore. They wanted to make peace two weeks earlier already. But it was the Russian army which marched through Manchuria and aimed to occupy Japan. And they had to get a message in the West and they had to get a message in the East uh, of this superiority in weapon technology in order not to do what they are planned to do or maybe planned to do. Um, so, so this, we would say, the most radical change to the point, if one should even have such a, a theory still, or if it was still possible to have such a theory, or if it was still possible to have any war which could be called just, that is the radical moment in which we find ourselves and think, think Francis, uh, Pope Francis was, is very much aware of this, and <clears throat> the moralists and the ethicists are thinking about this. 
<laughs> yeah. So I mean, there's we, we went through the three parts, or well, there's two traditional parts of the just war theory: the use ad bellum, the justness of the war itself, as you talked about, that there has to be a competent or the rightful authority has to be the one that calls for war, initiates a war, the probability of success, because without that probability of success, it's a suicide mission. I always think of Vietnam with the Pentagon Papers when it came very clear that the Pentagon knew Vietnam wasn't winnable, that yes. these young men were just dying in droves for an unwinnable war, which seems, I mean, that's just, if, if anything but unjust, right? Um, but war is a last resort, and then the cause itself must be just. And I think that's probably the one that's abused the most, really, in the modern period, you know, because we think about Again, whether it's Vietnam with the Pentagon Papers, you know, the soldiers were told they were going to fight tyranny and communism only to come to find out that through the Pentagon Papers, we were there to, you know, establish or keep open access to oil, tin and rubber and other resources. And so therefore, the cause has to be presented as a just cause. Yet at the same time, it's not. Um. And then after that, we have the the use in bell or the just conduct in war. So the distinction between enemy combatants and non-combatants, that's both wars that are going on right now between Russia and Ukraine and Israel and the Palestinians. That is a, a critique uh, of both of the aggressors, especially that they're not distinguishing between combatants and non-combatants. In fact, that non-combatants themselves in many ways are the true uh, targets of the war. Uh, proportionality, obviously, that's, um, you know, that's huge when you have uh, looking at the Israeli conflict with the Palestinians right now. The Hamas, I think, killed somewhere over a thousand people on October 7th, uh, 2023. And as we're recording this, up to 33,000 confirmed Palestinian dead. So it's just way out of proportion in terms of eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, and proportionality is supposed to come out of that. Military necessity, um, you know, that that actions for military success only not to punish uh, civilians. Um, that's obviously a very important one. Fair treatment of prisoners, as you talked about. And then the no malum in se or no evil means. And that, I think, is one that we're dealing with today. And you would think it would be something that belonged to the Middle Ages, but yet it's here again. You know, that's the use of, as you talked about, mass rape as the uh, one of the Soviet armies did in Germany. Uh, starvation, which is being used right now on Palestinians, on Palestinians in Gaza. Um, kidnapping, there's documented through NGOs, the UN and whatnot, tens of thousand Ukrainian kids have been kidnapped and sent into Russia. Uh, child soldiers, which you, um, which are easily found in a lot of, uh, specifically in a lot of third world countries using child soldiers but also biological, nuclear, and other weapons of mass destruction. Um, and hopefully those are, you know, especially nuclear weapons. As, as we were discussing this, I got a message on my phone from someone that uh, and more nuclear tests had been done by Putin just recently, and he's threat threatening the West with World War III with these new nuclear weapons that just came over the my news feed just now. So we're back into this Cold War, you know, posture of nation states looking at each other with animosity with their nuclear weapons pointing at each other. And it's it's an insane type of situation, but that's where we find ourselves again today. It's important that it's not so much a personal ethical decision, but it is the nature of the weapon system and the evolution of the weapons and uh, but the size of the armies, uh, I mean, the armies of the Middle Ages, they were small. You could, uh, when the battle took place in one village, you didn't even notice that it was going on in the other village. And so on. now there's huge territories. I mean, 10 million men fought in the first battle in Moscow in the winter battle. Uh, 10 million men. The whole army of Eisenhower was 350,000 men. There we can see what, what these modern things, what they mean in the, their mechanization and therefore their dehumanization in Worms, in the prison camp in Worms, I was there was 25,000 prisoners. And for a week, I didn't get anything to eat, but it was not the responsibility or the 
ability of the army. They did what they could, but they had a million men of their own, and they had suddenly millions of prisoners who didn't want to be caught by the Russians, and they all came to the West now. It was simply un impossible technologically, logistically, and so on, to, to feed people. And I've never complained about this. I complained about the Bolbeck concentration camp against his headsmen, but not, not about this. So one has to be very careful. And so that, that means the very nature of these weapons are such that you cannot, uh, even if you would like to, and you're a very moral person, and you would like to follow the, this, these rules, you cannot do it anymore because uh, I had this, my friend Ivan Supek, uh, the uh, man who was supposed to build the bomb for Tito, when he came to the end of his life, we had breakfast in Dubrovnik, and he said, he said, Rudy, I have these terrible dreams every night, and uh, I, I have killed all these German soldiers, and they are after me, and so on. And I said, Ivan, that is not possible. I said, you are a quantum physicist, you studied under Heisenberg, you are good in mathematics, Tito must have put you into the artillery. He said, yeah, that's right. So I said, you never saw anybody whom you killed. You killed people 10 miles away from you. You didn't even know what you were killing and so on. Yeah, he said, it's true, it's all true, but I'm dreaming anyway. And um, then I said, you could defend your country. That's your right. So the Germans had marched into Yugoslavia and though you could defend it, he said, yes, I know it's defended, but they are coming anyway. He said, you are a hopeless case. So he was a highly ethical man who not even taught quantum physics anymore as president of the University of Zagreb. And um, instead now uh, founded a peace movement and, can, and came to Western Michigan University and invited us. And I then started for 50 years to go there in terms of an east-west type of a contact. And it was very fruitful, very beautiful. So uh, nevertheless, the, um, the, uh, there is one thing, the human conscience and human judgment and so on, that's one side. But then there is this objective evolution of sciences. It, I mean, it's not so that people could not stop it somehow. Ivan Supek simply said no to Tito. I will not build this weapon. And so uh, Oppenheimer could have said that too. That is the whole tragedy of Oppenheimer. When he appeared before Truman, he said, I have blood on my hands, Mr. President. And he said, let's get that weeping baby out of here and so on. So um, obviously um, Truman had no bad conscience about what he did. He thought he hit what uh, the bombs were planned anyway. So he just had to execute it, but he had more bombs, which he did not use. So, um, therefore, but he was clear with him. He didn't have any blood on his hands, in spite of the fact that he gave the order. But <laughs> Oppenheimer did have it. So Oppenheimer was one of the most tragic people of the 20th century because he knew what was right. And even little details, he, he didn't want to throw the bomb on an island without people instead of on Tokyo and... Uh, uh, he was rather to to bomb, bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, in the last moment. So, so and and as far as religion is concerned, it was an army chaplain who put holy water on the Hiroshima bomb of Polish descent. And I mean, the monstrosity of this to be a, a member of the Jesus movement and the Jesus religion to bless the first atomic bomb, not to talk about calling it Trinity, be it now the Hindu Trinity or the Christian Trinity, and it was also the Christian Trinity, the horror the whole of blasphemy, which is behind all of this. And then the chaplain saw the pictures of Hiroshima and what it had done, and then blessed the second bomb and put holy water on it. And later on says he had been conditioned by the army and he couldn't have known it. He, he knew He knew what he was doing. So... There is still this problem, but then there is your of, of, of courage. The unbelievable courage to resist fascism, for instance. I experienced that in, in Germany, how hard that is when the whole culture around you becomes determined in this new authoritarianism and so on. And the, I mean, 
I would say that to resist that, like Bonhoeffer did, takes superhuman powers, needs grace in Christian terms. Otherwise, it's not possible. Yeah, I remember so, when um, in in the time that I mean, nothing like what you experienced in in, in the Third Reich, but even in the time two thousand and three in the United States when the war fervor was going on and being whipped up by the White House to go into Iraq, when they were saying that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and, you know, could cooperate and Saddam could give bin Laden nuclear weapons and the next attack on the United States will be a mushroom cloud. And I mean, all of this, and I remember very clearly, you know, Americans were frightened. They'd become very nationalistic. They were aggressive. They wanted to end these people. They didn't know the difference between bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. And then people like you and I, I mean, I remember you talking about it in class. I was giving public lectures or whatnot. I got death threats for it because I was a traitor and not patriotic and blah, 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 blah. But that 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 courage it takes to, to be within a country that has gone temporarily insane in many ways and or a mass psychosis and that, that is being pushed by the authority in and of itself, a rightful authority, in this case, the White House. Uh, it takes a whole lot of courage to stand up to that. Nevertheless, people like Bonhoeffer and yourself and, and myself in, in the war in Iraq were, were right, you know. But It's also a question how far this authoritarianism has, been pro has progressed. So when I was involved in, with the student movement and I got a police file for that, of which I'm very proud, but the um, police came into my house and... Uh, all, all Catholic uh, FBI people, and uh, so they had their revolvers, and my wife was frightened, and my children were frightened. But the whole system was still somewhat intact because the, the uh, judges, the judges downtown, simply put uh, limits to that, and you, and you cannot get into the house. You cannot get into the house of officers. You have to stay outside. <laughs> and they did stay outside. They obeyed the judges, and so on. So. As long as you have those protections still, you don't need too much courage. But when you have a total system of authoritarians, you know, then you have nobody to hold on to anymore. And Bonhoeffer could have rescued himself in the last moment. They wanted to use him that he should talk to the Allies. He had connections to England and he simply refused to stand up for this criminal system. That is why he finally in the Southern concentration camp was naked, hanged with his last thing where the guy who, uh, the Gestapo guy said, this is the end. And he said, no, it's not the end. I mean, this is superhuman. Yeah, and in, in Roland Freisler, the old Nazi judge who was a communist yeah. to fascism, he uh, he was the one, of course, who sentenced the the White Rose. You know these yeah. students and their professors to to death for them. I mean, because what they were doing was pointing out the very unjustness of the war yeah. that they wasn't winnable. That the the cause was unjust. You know that it was a, a war of of thievery as opposed to you know protection of of uh, the German civilization. That was just a foul excuse to do this war of yeah. 